directors ladies and gentlemen assalam alaikum and good afternoon we are going to start our post lunch session on the portal hypertension and i am the moderator of this session dr sultan ahmed chandyo i am representing the psh in the south and working as assistant professor of medicine at chandka medical college ladkana as all of you are knowing that portal hypertension is one of the deadly complication of liver cirrhosis the you and me are dealing dealing the many patients of the portal hypertension and its complication in our daily life practice so let us so let us learn the different aspects of portal hypertension from the galaxy of our speakers for the start of the session i will request our speakers to occupy the seat of the chair for that i request professor mohammad arif nadeem saab to occupy the seat of chair person dr mohammad arif nadeem is the professor of medicine and gastroenterology at services institute of medical sciences and hospital lahore then i will request professor hafiz mughis atahar Dr. Mughi Sathar is the professor of gastroenterology and hepatology at Faisalabad Medical University Faisalabad. And in the last I will request the facilitator of this session Dr. Asif Gul to occupy the seat of chairperson. He is the professor of gastroenterology at Services Hospital Lahore. Dr. Asif please. So with the permission of the chairs uh, dear audience I will i will repeat certain rules that we as we can complete our session with the time i request all the audience that you write down your questions and make this session interactive write down the questions on the paper and please provide this to our it uh, team and i will again request the speakers to be on the uh, time so for the first speakers we have the professor dr javed ikbal faruqi saab he will talk on the uh, portal hypertension and beta blockers the current consensus as all of you are knowing the professor javed ikbal faruqi he does not need any introduction but for those who are unaware of it professor dr javed ikbal faruqi is the professor of hepatology and gastroenterology in the life care hospital and research institute hyderabad peshawar pakistan he is also the ceo of the al hayat clinical and research center Dabgadi Garden Peshawar he is the ex hod of the medical unit at government lady reading hospital khyber khyber medical university peshawar he is the he remained the past president of the pakistan society of hepatology and dr javed ikbal faruqi has many of the national and international papers many of the students in his credit and research awards in the epasil and different international societies he is among the authors of the national and clinical practice guidelines on different subjects in the pakistan so i will request sir professor javed ikbal faruqi saab to come on the dais thank you very much uh, thank you dr sultan chandyo for your kind introduction uh is this topic has been communicated to me only yesterday mm, so i will try to do justice with the topic uh the heading is the portal hypertension and beta blockers uh, current consensus as per my habit i will start from the basics to make it easy for my pgs uh, i hope they are uh, in the hall and then we will go to the uh, current consensus uh, what's the uh, uh, current standing of these uh, i showed this slide to you yesterday the pathophysiology of the uh portal hypertension the chronic liver disease and the cirrhosis and if i define the cirrhosis it is a chronic liver disease characterized by portal hypertension this will be the simple definition the portal hypertension is the main culprit the underlying way uh, by which the uh, decompensation happens and if it is less than 5 it's normal no cirrhosis though the patient is chronic liver disease but if it is more than 5 uh, then it becomes a portal hypertension but again i uh, discussed with you up to 10 it's insignificant and more than 10 it is significant and why i say this when it is portal hypertension uh, but less than 
then there are no varices and no ascites. This is when it crosses the magic figure of 10 and uh, till 12, this is a time when the varices develop. But when it increases uh, uh, above 12, then either the varices rupture or the ascites uh, appear. So this is the breakup of this portal hypertension and my PGs and uh, my primary care physicians where the facilities of this liver uh, fibroscan and endoscopies may not be there, don't worry. If you do the use the APRI and FIP4, to great extent this correlates if your patient has got uh, uh, portal hypertension to more than 10, less than 10 like here and it can help you out. So uh, this is not uh, a very difficult task to classify your patients that what is going to be the underlying portal hypertension in these patients. I also shared this slide with you yesterday that out of uh, 2,700 uh, 2, patients, around 1,200 they were they presented with ascites. So ascites is the first event of decompensation. It's true for our patients as well as uh, anywhere. So just this is for my PGs and young uh, colleagues. We know this is the portal vein and uh, made from this uh, in, uh, superior mesenteric and this is splenic vein supplying the 70% of the blood to the liver and then reaches and down to the sinusoidal level. And then to the sinusoidal level, the blood is uh, drained back to the heart by the portal vein. This is a simple pathophysiological understanding. Uh, the Ohm's law, this is the phys physical law, but it is very well applied uh, for the portal hypertension as well, it says that the voltage is directly related to the current and to the resistance and when we convert it to the uh, portal hypertension and the medicals, then the portal, uh, the pressure gradient through the portal vein is directly proportional that this is the outcome of the flow in the blood, the flow of blood and the resistance to the flow of the blood. And when we apply this Poiseuille law, then this uh, resistance it tells that the small decrease in vessel radius results in large increase in portal pressure. So these are the very basic physiological concepts, which uh, I won't go into the detail of that, but you should be knowing that when we say the portal pressure decrease matters, rest is really matters. So the portal pressure is equal to the blood flow multiplied by resistance. So any component, whether you increase the blood flow or you increase the resistance, you will find the portal means pressure to be raised, to be on the right side. So when we say portal hypertension, either blood flow is increased or resistance is increased. And then the resistance to the blood flow is increased at three levels. This is, I'm saying the broad spectrum because followed my lectures probably is a non serotic portal hypertension. So here it will be easier to you to understand. And this resistance to blood flow may be prehepatic, hepatic or post-hepatic. Let's see in detail. This is the, the first condition when there is increased uh, uh, in blood flow which leads to the portal hypertension. This is the portal vein, the blood flow is increased, there is panic vasodilatation. So more blood is coming to the liver through the portal vein. So raised amount of blood volume in the portal vein leading to portal hypertension. Then coming to the increased resistance to blood flow. In the prehepatic causes, the most common cause is the portal and splenic vein thrombosis. And then in the hepatic, there is pre-sinusoidal, sinusoidal, and post-sinusoidal. The pre-sinusoidal, this is the sinus. The pre-sinusoidal, the most common cause is schistosomiasis, congenital hepatic fibrosis, and idiopathic portal hypertension. This is the one which uh, we will be touching on, the sinusoidal level of increased resistance to the blood flow in the liver. And this is the most common cause is the cirrhosis, and here, we see the distorted sinusoidal architecture which leads to the increased pressure which is offered to the blood flow coming through the portal vein. And then the post sinusoidal, again the venoclusive disease, this is at this level and the post hepatic is at the hepatic one level when there is a thrombus. So this is the simple classification of resistance or the causes of portal hypertension because of the resistance at what side uh, it is present. Another concept is that of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a potent vasodilator in the body. So high 
concentration of nitric oxide in the blood will lead to vasodilatation. And low nitric oxide concentration will lead to increased sensitivity of vasoconstrictors and increased endothelial response to vasodilators. Let's apply this clinically to our patients. This is the patients, the uh, intrahepatic circulation and the spectrum circulation. And we see a paradox. In cirrhosis, we see a paradox. On the splenic side, there is increased concentration of nitric oxide, while in the intrahepatic side, we see decrease in the nitric oxide concentration. And what it does, it leads to vasodilatation in the splenic circulation. So more blood is being poured or coming to the portal vein. So the one component increased in blood volume in the portal vein is there. Second, it leads to the vasoconstriction in the intrahepatic uh, circulation. Normally, the nitric oxide plays a major role in regulating intrahepatic resistance in cirrhosis. Uh, the, this nitric oxide activity is reduced, so leads to the vasoconstriction. This is a normal liver uh, vasculature. This is the cirrhotic, decreased number of nitric oxide. So there is uh, intrahepatic uh, vasoconstriction. So what happens? That intra increased intrahepatic resistance it is one is irreversible one component is irreversible there is almost 70 percent and this is related to the distortion of the liver macro vascular uh, architecture the collagen deposition and the fibrosis deposition another component is reversible one it's a dynamic one and it is related to endothelial dysfunction which leads to decreased nitric oxide concentration and increased release of vasoconstrictors like prostonides, xenothelines and others. And this is the point when we will touching on when we come to the beta blockers. One will be that we will try to reduce the blood flow into the portal vein. So the portal hypertension lowers down. Second to relieve this reversible, address this reversible uh, component and thus the intrahepatic vasoconstriction is treated so there is less resistance offered to the portal vein. So because of these two then the portal hypertension will go down. This is again uh, the basic concepts. We all know the alpha receptor, alpha 1 uh, and alpha 2 receptors they are distributed in the systemic and uh, uh, splanchnic blood vessels and when they stimulate they lead to vasoconstriction. And when they are blocked, the result will be unopposed, uh, the vasoconstriction, so vasodilatation will happen. While the beta 1 receptors, they are distributed in the myocardium. And when we stimulate these, it leads to increased heart rate and cardiac contraction. As a result, there is increased cardiac output, so more blood is being put into the portal vein. And by blockade of it, there is reduced heart rate and reduced con uh, contraction, so decreased in cardiac output. Then the beta 2 receptors, they are distributed in the splanchnic blood vessels. And when we stimulate these, it will lead to vasodilatation. And when we block these, the result will be vasoconstriction. Now here comes the uh, goal. The propanolol, the non-selective beta blocker, it blocks these beta 1 receptors and beta 2 receptors. So they decrease the cardiac output and contraction, leading it to decreased cardiac output and then the the vasoconstriction, so the splanchnic vasoconstriction is there, blood is diverted from the splanchnic to the periphery, and less amount of blood is coming to the portal vein. So this is one mechanism. The carvedilol, it has got beta receptor blocker activity as well as alpha-1 receptor blocker activity. So it does help the portal hypertension with this mechanism, as well as by blocking the alpha receptors, it also causes vasodilatation at the cardiac level, the uh, hepatic level, so that dynamic or reversible 30% vasoconstriction or resistance goes down. So this is the main difference between these two, the uh, carvedilol and the propanolol. Again, the same has been explained here, I won't go into the detail in the interest of time. So the non-selective beta blocker, where beta-1 receptors blockade, reduced heart rate and cardiac output with a decrease in the flow of about 20%. Whereas the beta 2 receptors blockade, that is the non-selective beta blocker, cause splenic vasoconstriction due to unopposed adrenergic tone. 
and I discussed with you how it happens. With a subsequent additional decrease in portal co collateral blood flow of 15%, the so total 35% reduction in portal venous inflow is there because of these two. But what we see, uh, 15, so cumulative, but we see clinically it's a 15% reduction in the portal hypertension by using beta blocker. And why it is so? Because of the unopposed energetic tone, the non-selective beta blockers cause mild increase in peripheral and hepatic resistance. There is some sort of that, especially when you're using the propranolol. So what you get by at these splank neck are the, the blood flow levels, 35%, it may not be translated to the clinically and it may remain only 15%. But when you use carvedilol, probably you get all that uh, possible effect. So carvedilol is a non-selective beta blocker that has an intrinsic alpha-1 receptor blocking effect, uh, which causes intrahepatic vasodilatation and further decrease the portal hypertension. Uh, this is very important that carvedilol is more effective in reducing hepatic venous pressure than propranolol uh, at relatively high doses. This is uh, what has been found at low doses as well, which we use, at least I personally use in most of my patients, the very low dose that is 6.25 milligram or 12.5 milligram. It does not cause hypotension. This is the point with it, but decreased portal pressure significantly more than propranolol. Studies have found this. So at the low dose, when you compare the low dose of propranolol and carvedilol, carvedilol has got an edge. It won't lead to hypotension, but it will lead to decrease in portal pressure. So the low doses cause only more rate decrease in cardiac output. So the point is that the carvedilol has got an edge when you are, are compelled to prescribe low dose because of the hypotension or uh, intolerability of beta blockers by the patient. Clinical benefits of non-selective beta blockers uh, it stems from their uh, ability at the portal venous flow as well as the cardiac resistance. The gradient, this is point, must be at least 10% of the baseline, preferably 20% or below 12 millimeter to prevent the first bleed. I mean, the pressure is more than 10, but less than 12. So you want that it should remain uh, less than 12 or lower down. You need 10% or ideally 20% decrease. And when the rebleeding, it should be at least 20% or below 12. But good point is when you, uh, the patient receives the propranolol. You get the 50% of this. 50% of your patients, uh, they have shown that the decrease is there. And with carvedilol, 75% of the patients uh, has been found that the response is there. So you don't need to check in each and every patient do the hepatic penis pressure gradient. At least it's not available clinically here. So you can these studies you can help you out that when you are giving this patient these drugs, probably you are getting the response. So the uh, this is the uh, summary of whatever uh, uh, studies are there. I'll just briefly for pre-primary prophylaxis, there is no indications to prevent viruses uh, or progression. For prevention of the decompensation, yes, no, it has been indicated. I'll share with you the studies. And decompensation, the first event of decompensation, as I told you, this is the ascites worldwide. And then it's followed by the bleed. For prevention of the first variceal bleed, Again, it is indicated the beta blockers used are indicated. For prevention of the rebleeding, that is the secondary prophylaxis, again it is indicated. For gastric viruses, no strong evidence for the use of beta blockers. And for portal apparition, gastro, gastro, uh, per, uh, gastropathy, again it, the, uh, these are indicated. So in the pre-primary prophylaxis and in the gastric viruses, there is no strong evidence rather than in pre-primary prophylaxis, they are not indicated because there is one randomized clinical trial which failed to show prevention of the large viruses and more adverse events. In the rest, the understanding is that you prescribe the beta blockers to them. I'll share this uh, study with you, which was the beta blockers to prevent decompensation of cirrhosis in patients with clinically significant portal hypertension. Uh, this trial was multi-center, double-blind, randomized controlled trial, and uh, they included the patients with clinically significant portal hypertension, but compensated cirrhosis and they give the non-selective beta blockers to see what happens when you give and you don't give. Uh, this is the first randomized controlled trial to show the long-term treatment with non-selective beta blockers and they decrease the clinical decompensation. And we know that uh, this is the, when they follow the patient, ascites is the first. We used to give the beta blockers to prevent the, in the primary prophylaxis and secondary prophylaxis of viral bleed. 
with the study extended the canvas extended the spectrum are uh, the possibilities are indications that no even it uh, delays the decay first decompensatory event of all in this patient that is the ascites uh, one third of the patients in this trial received carvedilol two thirds received propanolol their dose were adjusted based on the heart rate and blood pressure carvedilol they found it's a much more potent non selective beta blocker and uh, patients who received carvedilol had a greater portal pressure gradient reducing and uh, uh, and had better outcome this is the when they found when there was no intervention the 14% of the patient they had ascites and the 3% of that patient they developed the uh, viruses and when they compared the uh, group where they give the beta blockers what they found that incidence of decompensation or death significantly lower in the uh, non selective beta blocker group so it was really helping uh, these patients a difference is mainly related to the reduced incidence of ascites it was not the bleed even in ascites so the ascites was uh, the appearance was delayed as compared to the one who were not using the non selective beta blockers so uh, what we were knowing that the prevention of the varicel bleed and to uh, rupture or if they are ruptured to prevent the re bleed this was additional benefit rather this was the first benefit to be seen in these patients that ascites appearing is delayed in these patients uh, hemodynamic pressure again the non selective beta blockers were having the uh, better Uh, and this is the cumulative incidence developing decompensation again in the uh, beta blocker group. It was uh, better in that. So the, this study concluded that a long-term treatment with beta blocker can increase decompensation free survival in patients with compensated cirrhosis and clinical significant portal hypertension, mainly reducing by the incidence of ascites. So the indications for the beta blocker has increased now. but we know uh, side effects i won't put the details but you should be careful about these as well so uh, dear chairman and dear colleagues to sum up the cirrhosis is the story of the portal hypertension degree of the portal pressure so in the compensated or asymptomatic they have got longer survival because their portal pressure is low but as the portal pressure increases they develops the bleeding ascites and peptic encephalopathy and their uh survival is compromised and the magic figure is a tan figure so if we can prevent the uh, portal pressure to be crossing this tan figure then you can help these patients to have good survival by delaying the onset of the ascites as well as in, uh, delaying the onset of the uh varicel bleed i also said uh, the, yesterday the cirrhotics are very delicate uh, people we need to give extra care to these patients this is very important so the take home points after a diagnosis of cirrhosis is made the next step is to determine whether the patient has clinically significant portal hypertension or not and for this you don't need to do the hpvg measurements all those things even by the apri and fip4 you can be sure enough that whether my patient has got the clinical significant portal hypertension or not i discuss shared with you the first slide and if so if the you think the patient has got clinical significant hypertension then you start non selective beta blocker to prevent the decompensation non selective beta blockers prevent decompensation mainly through ascites ascites is the first decompensatory event so it delays that in patients with clinically significant portal hypertension so with this i thank you all for the kind listening uh, though this was communicated to me yesterday i hope i have been uh, successful to give the concept of portal hypertension and what are the uh, its uh, uh, adverse events and how we can intervene to uh, have good impact on the survival of the patients thank you very much thank you professor farooq sahab